Let, let's go to the uh, topic as such. So this would be the outline in which I will be doing this presentation. So basically, it's going to be a case-based approach. And uh, through this discussion, as we uh, move along, we will be uh, discussing some gray areas in definitions, um, whether we can agree on an uh, initial, tre initial treatment protocol, uh, what are the usual um, we, what, what are the usual investigations we plan as a part of workup in refractory and super refractory seizures? And uh, then some PICU challenges definitely will be focusing more on the pediatric critical care aspect than general management so that it will be more useful to the members of our forum. And then we'll have a um, session on a brief talk on how do you work up on autoimmune encephalitis, what investigations are desirable. So anytime you feel like um, in the members of our forum can definitely unmute and ask questions if you feel like sharing your wisdom and experience. Uh, otherwise, we will be planning, we will be rotating questions and uh, these areas of discussion would be concentrated more around the invited faculty. So, and Ajay uh, from Baby Memorial has kindly volunteered to keep note of questions posted in the chat box so that we can have a question and answer session towards the end where we can have uh, open discussion with the invited faculty. And then we'll take some, uh, have some summary and take away messages towards the end. So, so this is a case which we, chat, which we recently had in Rajagiri Hospital and uh, he was a seven year old boy who presented to us uh, with history of fever for one day, just one day and that was four days prior to the admission and then became completely febrile. With that, he presented uh, to, uh, and on the day of fever, he uh, had a cognitive seizure, this uh, focal uh, right oromotor seizure with some cognitive involvement like uh, disorientation and uh, uh, sudden change in behavior. He was seen in a local hospital on that day and was discharged home in the evening as he remained to be uh, stable there without any seizure recurrence. And but then same the evening, he had another focal onset with secondary generalization seizure involving both upper limb and lower limb. So it was start with to start with again, it was a focal oromotor seizure and then became generalized involving both upper limb and lower limb. So he was again taken to this local hospital where as we all do, uh, was given a first dose of benzodiazepine and then was loaded with uh, phenytoin and was sent to our hospital. Other history, he is a second of a non-consanguinous marriage, second born child, with no significant past medical history except for a admission with some febrile illness which turned out to be a, a Epstein-Barr viral infection one day, one year prior to the present episode. There is no family history of seizure disorder or any other neurological issues and they had a normal development. So our treatment and investigation part, he was uh, chosen, I mean, treated with the triple regime as most of the units I believe would do with ceftriaxone, clarithromycin and acyclovir. As he was already loaded with phenytoin, we put him on maintenance dose. Is the baseline investigations, blood, RFT, LFT, electrolytes, blood sugar, uh, calcium, magnesium, everything was normal. And EEG at that point uh, showed some non specific slowing, but definitely no epileptiform activity as such. The MRI brain and spine with contrast was done normal. CSF was done at admission, which was again normal. No significant CSF pleocytosis. Biochemistry was essentially normal. Oligoconal gland was negative. We did a CSF viral panel, which was also negative. Blood and CSF cultures were reported sterile. But then he remained drowsy and sleepy. GCS was more than 10. Airway was clearly maintained. The, no neurological signs or focal deficits or no papilledema or posturing. On day four, that is like uh, fourth day, evening of admission. He was on antibiotics till then, but then fourth day he had a seizure recurrence, which actually progressed to become refractory and then was mechanically ventilated. So then we loaded him with levetiracetam, which is our protocol. We uh, starting um, a drug we use in our unit is levetiracetam, uh, followed by as seizures continued, we put him on midazolam infusion, which had to be gradually increased up to 12 microgram per kg per minute and was put on 
continuous EEG monitoring. So at this point, I think the quick learning points and the uh, from this particular case would have, will be like, say, uh, any seizure could have a potential for worsening. And then there are some soft pointers in history, like say one day history and then febrile. And uh, he was not completely waking up after an uh, episode of clinical seizure, which was actually terminated with no further occurrence, but he had some drowsiness. And then uh, again for a unit with junior trainees and our discussion for discussion completion part, we know that we, our discuss our um, management should be systematic with ABC assessment and then we should always keep in mind that any child can deteriorate and may uh, actually go in for a uh, ventilation and airway issues anytime in any unit. So any child not achieving seizure control. So basically for a pediatric uh, point of view, general pediatrician point of view, I think any child not completely achieving a seizure control with a benzodiazepine and any first line drug chosen in adequate dose uh, has to be labeled as refractory and has to be refer, uh, referred for a PICU care. So at this point, I would um, request Akbar uh, from uh, Dr. Akbar, uh, based on your experience, what do you feel like, I mean, this particular case or in general, uh, what advice would you give to the pediatric unit or the junior pediatric trainees when they approach a general case of seizure. May yeah. not be but then... Right, right, right. yeah. So uh, you are rightly pointed out, uh, Bipin. Uh, thanks for pointing out the points. So basically here we have a uh, um, seven-year-old or a nine-year-old boy, seven-year-old boy, isn't it? So yeah, okay. the illness starts with uh, one day non-specific fever and uh, he goes on to have seizure in the morning and seizure again in the evening. Right. So when a fever precedes a particular neurological deficit or a neurological symptom or uh, when a fever, you know, immediately follows a neurological symptoms in the first uh, 72 hours, by definition, it is acute encephalitis syndrome. So rightly so, we think about acute encephalitis syndrome. And then we have started our uh, empirical therapy with uh, acyclovir, cetraxon and clarithromycin. All these points are very right. So only one point is that uh, when we see that the child doesn't uh, wake up appropriately and still seems to have, you know, a lingering low GCS or GCS around 10, 11 or 12, right? So uh, despite loading with an anti-epileptic, that's the point that probably we have to think that there is much more thing than just an infection which is contributing to an encephalopathy. So uh, we just need to be much more alert uh, in such scenarios, okay? We have to look for a non-convulsive status or any other subtle signs of seizures and we need to evaluate further. But having said that, I think uh, this child has been appropriately managed and he was under close monitoring for GCS. I think his motor response was good enough. He did not require any uh, airway. He didn't have any airway instability. So as I mean, as a pediatrician seeing such a children, well, my only advice is that if a child seems to have this sort of a lingering encephalopathy, uh, just be careful. It may not be just an uh, encephalitis. It can, uh, can, you know, it may be just a red herring for further progression. That's what comes to my mind. Uh, anything else maybe Dr. Darshan can add? Uh, no, exactly that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's not much to add at this point of time. So as right. uh, was right. rightly said, we should right. just be watchful at that point. Exactly. Yeah. No, do Dr. Parag, I would ask you this particular question. When would you actually ask your pediatric colleagues to be uh, to start worry about a child with seizure? Because you know most of the time, a seizure for that matter is the bread and butter of routine pediatric of normal pediatric care, mostly febrile seizures. But then. At some point in time, would uh, you, as a pediatric intensivist, would say, "Okay, this is the time will I need to intervene? You need to ask for a intensivist help." Well, from that point, would you, um, when would be the right time for a pediatric intensive care referral? So uh, it's clear, I means uh, uh, the answer would be ABC. So if you have any of the issue related to the ABC. Uh, you should take care of, uh, like actually you should call your pediatric intensivist. But sometimes what uh, uh, Akbar said, you have to be very clear. So there are a few things. One is uh, when the seizures are escalating. So you should not wait that my child should lose an airway and then I'm going to shift the child to the PICU. That's one thing. So in between the seizure, child is not waking up. Probably again, another sign that this child requires more monitoring. 
uh, as Akbar said, uh, there is a chances of non-convulsive status. And we are we are actually concentrating on seizures, but there is another thing which is going to come into the picture is a raise ICP. So we have to take care of the raise ICP in the form of airway, uh, CO2 targeted ventilation, normothermia. They might be a febrile at that point of time. Third thing is a uh, lot of these kids after receiving uh, antiepileptics, they start having pooling of secretion and they most of the time their gag will be poor and uh, they might start aspirating also. And we have seen a lot of kids uh, post seizure, they aspirate. Fourth thing is uh, any child as such in our institute, any child who is going on midazolam infusion more than five micrograms. So they should come to the PICU. Why they should come to the PICU? One is a continuous monitoring of seizure, which is very, very difficult into the ward. Uh, second thing is a lot of these kids who comes on the midazolam infusion, they require a continuous EEG monitoring. Again, this is a second indication. Third indication is most of these kids who are on actually midazolam infusion already, we have tried two antiepileptics. So there is a possible chance of escalation and uh, loss of airway. So my take home from this scenario is don't wait that the child is going to lose airway, then I'm going to shift to the PICU. So standard protocol, any child going on continuous infusion of anti uh, antiepileptics should go to the PICU. Be aware of a subtle, probably loss of air in the form of pooling of secretions. Third thing is uh, be vigilant about raise ICP features. Great, thank you. That was a really wonderful discussion. That that beautifully summarizes most of the initial seizure management from a pediatric intensivist point of view. So moving on with the case, this was the seizure phenotype. Hope you can see the clear oromotor seizures. This was when uh, the child got sick and then he required mechanical ventilation. If you see the EEG, if you can concentrate here, you it starts off with a right focal seizure and then becomes kind of lateralizing epileptic on discharges. Then became general, becomes generalized. Uh, Dr. Darshan, you do, do you want to comment anything on the EEG pattern as such? Uh, yes, from the, uh, from the EEG, what is very clear is you can see the sort of uh, lateralized uh, epileptic form. It's maybe a little slightly asymmetric at bipeds. So when, once you see these sort of patterns on the EEG, um, it should ring alarm bells. And we are dealing with something more than just an epilepsy. And we're thinking um, more that there is something metabolic or immune mediated process that is going on. Um, and then uh, that is when we start we need to start actively thinking about the etiology and proactively treating or uh, proactively starting presumptive treatment for this so that we're not leaving it too late. So that is the only take a message from that. You can see a beautiful demonstration of a focal seizure starting with bipleds uh, and um, lateralizing uh, with coming from one hemisphere and the which beautifully fits in with the phenotype that we are seeing where there is left focal motor seizures and um, and uh, that's coming from one hemisphere. So there is something hemispheric going on. There is inflammation. There's probably inflammation. There's some some degree of um, uh, metabolic derangement um, giving you this e EEG picture. And then we have to start thinking about immune encephalitis. Um, or if it was a younger child, uh, say less than two years, certainly all the metabolic uh, epilepsy syndromes will come in the picture. Okay, so moving on the next slide, um, we have been actually uh, seeing a lot of standard textbook discussions on the definitions with which are tightly time bound saying five minutes or 24 hours, uh, 60 minutes and all. So there are some interesting uh, 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 advancements which are coming up in, in the definitions as such from the pathophysiology part of uh, status epileptica. So uh, we were discussing this slide with Dr. Akbar and Dr. Darshan before. So uh, Dr. Darshan, uh, would you like to uh, discuss this to the general audience, the new concepts of how you define a status epileptica and when do you really call it as refractory or super refractory? Um, so I mean, one thing in uh, neurology and medicine that we've already always experienced is there's always a redefinition of uh, definitions, if you like. Uh, and this has gone through multiple iterations uh, from, uh, and if you look at do a literature search, you will find it very confusing when you start from maybe 1970s onwards, that uh, the definition has changed so many times. And previously we were fixing on 
uh, times. And now the latest uh, approach that people have recognized is to take a maybe a physiological approach and understand what uh, really matters. And, and from that point of view, it has been sort of timelined as a T1 time point and a T2 time point. And so how my take on this T1 time point is when we know that most of the seizures, when they start, they terminate probably within five minutes, spontaneously. You don't need to do anything. That is um, an innate mechanism of the body to regulate um, uh, the balance of uh, stimulation and inhibition. And if that process doesn't automatically happen at five minutes, then we know that you're probably not going to need some help for doing or for stopping the seizures. So from that point of view, the T1 five minutes is very important that if it has not stopped at that point, it's a prolonged seizure, you need to intervene. Second point is when you start getting uh, decompensation and when there's risk of irreversible neuronal injury. And that time point is probably around 30 minutes. And that is what we estimate. Uh, and that has come from uh, uh, a combination of animal models as well as um, physiological studies where multiple factors, uh, including the blood pressure, blood oxygenation, brain oxygenation, et cetera, deteriorate. So from a point of view, that time point T2 is also very important. And sometimes we take that as a, as a half an hour. But the main important point is if the seizures are not controlled in a timely fashion before the secondary decompensation in the body happens, then you are, your risk of developing irreversible neuronal injury increases. So that, that is probably how we need to conceptualize treatment. Anything else, Akbar, you want to add? Uh, no, uh, rightly said, Darshan. Um, I mean, if you look at the, as you rightly told, no, the definitions keep on changing. So when we used to know, uh, know, before not long ago, we used to call it as early status epilepticus and established status epilepticus. So when the time limits were somewhere between uh, 5 to 30 minutes, uh, we used to call it as early. And when the time crosses around 30 minutes, we used to call it as established status epilepticus. I mean, I mean, uh, the terms are almost the same. T1 just means that there is a failure of mechanism by the body to terminate a seizure, which means your seizure is now going to be prolonged. And T2 actually means there's a stage of decompensation. Your status is more established and there is more neuronal injury. One uh, interesting point here is that I think the T1 and T2 also changes depending upon whether the patient is a de novo patient or a, a child who's having a first episode status versus a child who's used to having status epilepticus like a child with epilepsy. So the concepts also say that if a child is a very known epileptic patient or having focal epilepsy, your T1 can be like 10 minutes and your T2 or time two can be actually up to one hour, which means that uh, these children are more used to having seizures. And so their chance of decompensating takes much more time. So you have around one hour time before which there's a significant neuronal injury starts to happening. So this again gives a uh, very good concepts for intensive care that if you know that the child is a known epileptic patient or is having a well recognized structural cause for having epileptic seizures, then you have more time for you to control your seizures. Like rather than half an hour, I think that is you have time up to one hour so that, uh, you know, uh, the neuronal injury does not set in. But I mean, what is your take on this uh, Darshan? I feel uh, these concepts uh, is probably also important. Yes, Dashan, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I personally haven't um, yeah. brought those sort of uh, yeah. definitions or uh, boundaries in my practice. Yeah. Uh, purely because when we say all these time limits, actually, it really, mm -hmm. it all really needs to happen on the shop floor where you are getting your infusions ready and you're moving right. on with, uh, with decision making. So when you think, the child is refractory. Once we get to the point that we've used a benzodiazepine or we use two benzodiazepines in the child is, and we have got another infusion uh, or mm -hmm. another load dose of phenytoin or any other appropriate um, anti-epileptic, anti seizure medication is on board, then we need to make the decision this is refractory and we need to move on with our next step of management. So in practice, I haven't differentiated between whether it is structural or de novo or uh, whether the child has a 
has experienced only because of the pra pragmatic point of view is just we need to get on and treat. Sometimes it may take, uh, you know, if how, depending on how well prepared we are, it may take, even if we're in our best of uh, situations, we want to start something soon, it will probably take another half an hour to set up everything and up and, and be up and running with it. So uh, I think it's important to make that uh, mental note that you have made the decision that it is refractory and you need to move on with the next step. Uh, so that was a nice uh, point of discussion. So a pediatric intensivist point of view, I think the main concept that should be there while managing such kind of patients is that as, as the C-shift uh, interval increases from refractory to super refractory, the tougher it becomes. And the chances of essential or permanent neuronal injury and reversible neuronal injury, chances of irreversible injury goes high. So. That is it. So if you see the literature, almost 23 to 40 percentage in different case series have mentioned that almost 23 to 45 percentage of status epileptics can still be refractory. And um, super refractory by definition, I think it is an, a seizure which lasts essentially for more than 24 hours on an anesthetic therapy or a seizure which comes back after withdrawing uh, from an anesthetic therapy. So with that, um, we'll come to the discussion again. So what would be the major differential diagnosis you consider at this point, Dr. Akbar, for this particular case? Uh, right, okay, Bipin, um, like we, ha we had seen this child is almost having a biphasic sort of a presentation, you know. On the first day, he had a status with a fever. And then again, he had a secondary deterioration on day five or day six. Uh, so this is something that would be a point me to uh, think about much more than infection. So autoimmune would be top on my list and uh, considering the age group and considering the way that he's showing a very bad seizures, I would also think about certain inflammatory causes as well. Uh, I won't think about vascular causes uh, primarily because I don't uh, feel that there is any deficits or uh, any features of raised ICT and so on and so. So among the differentials, I would think uh, primarily in terms, in addition to infection, I would also think about autoimmune encephalitis and uh, inflammatory brain diseases on a broader uh, term at this particular stage. Maybe mm -hmm. rarely some metabolic as well. Some rare metabolic conditions uh, um, can also show secondary deterioration. Uh, but uh, if the child was previously absolutely well without any failure to thrive or without any short stature or without any developmental issues, uh, uh, metabolic may be, or metabolic or genetic may be last on my list. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's some next question may be, uh, look, a bit childish as such, but then uh, there, ha there had been a concept, like there is a definite, so for that matter, we all know that the first choice of seizure control is always a benzodiazepine, whatever be the route, but then uh, there, had been, there has been always an impression that there is a first-line uh, agent after benzodiazepine to choose from. Like say, like which one is better, like conventional anti-epileptics, phenytoin, valproate, uh, carbamazepine. Also, is there a definite first-line agent or there a direct head-to-head head -to -head control, uh, control studies in pediatrics, which says that at least in status, this is the preferred uh, first-line agent after benzodiazepine? Um, so I think uh, there are multiple studies where they have done head-to-head -head studies. You know, there are studies where they have compared uh, levetiracetam with phenytoin and valproate. Um, uh, to be honest, when we look at the efficacy, there isn't much to choose between these agents. Okay. Um, probably uh, from the efficacy point of view, they are all very similar. But the side effect profile is probably slightly more slightly dependent. That's probably what we make people choose certain um, anti-epileptic. So if they're less than two years and we are not clear, we don't know this child, they've come in for the first time, the child has never been worked up and you cannot absolutely roll out a mitochondrial disorder, then probably choosing malproate is not a good idea. Uh, if the child um, is had a prolonged seizure, outside and has a hypotensive, is cardiovascularly unstable, then uh, maybe, you know, you, not giving phenytoin in the first instance may not be a bad idea until you get better access and better cardiovascular control. 
Uh, Levetiracetam, from that point of view, uh, has got a better safety profile, um, but it's not uh, superior to any of these drugs. Um, so from a second line point of view, you could use any of these drugs, uh, but the major important point is, uh, I think from my point of view is not to carry on using um, multiple, if you like, second line agents. Uh, and just to um, come back to that basic definition what we are trying to talk today about what, did, what constitutes refractoriness uh, and then move on with more um, anesthetic agents, uh, maybe starting with midazolam infusion, which has got probably the most evidence so far uh, in efficacy with regards to controlling refractory seizures. Uh, and then quickly moving on to anesthetic agents. So while we are waiting for maybe, uh, while the midazolam is already on board, uh, or while the thiopentin is already on board, you probably want to have secondary plans as to you want to wean them off midazolam and you want to wean them off thiopentone. So then you will want something else in the in your armory already loaded in the kit so that it can be sodium alpurate, it can be phenytoin, uh, or it could be levetiracetam. So it is you use one of these agents depending on the clinical scenario, and if it is refractory, move on to the next, but plan for de-escalation and have something else on board. Right. So I think the next question, when do you consider intubation has been ni nicely deliberated by Parag already. But uh, next, uh, I would like to address the next question to Parag again. I uh, hope you are still with us. Now, wh what is your mean? There are, you know that EEG, continuous EEG monitoring, ambulatory EEG monitoring would be uh, a part and parcel of PICU care when it comes to uh, status. Then how, how, yeah. how does your unit work on? Because you know, I don't think there is a spe specific for protocol as to which one you do use, the A channel, 31 channel. So for practical purpose in a basic pediatric ICU, um, uh, how does it work in your unit at least? So uh, what happens, we have an EEG technician, if it is a daytime kind of a thing, so we definitely call our colleague neurologists. They come by, they assess, and uh, they take a call about. Uh, we have a two machines, so they take a call about uh, starting continuous EEG monitoring. Uh, there might be a time we have three, four patients with uh, status epilepticus. So depending upon the severity, we take a call who goes on kind of an intermittent monitoring and who goes on continuous monitoring. Uh, third thing is uh, uh, most of the unit phase uh, is uh, non-availability of technicians or probably I would say neurological fellow throughout the night. So what we did, uh, one of uh, two of our ICU fellow, we trained them to put the EEG uh, leads. And uh, by that, our EEG monitor became very, very easy. So whenever we have a child and specifically in the night and we don't have a neurologist, uh, definitely child will be an EEG monitor, whether it is indicated or not. What I wanted to say, we, we have a kind of a uh, uh, good threshold, I would not say very low threshold, to get the child on uh, EEG monitoring. And uh, uh, sometimes what happens, one of, a few of our neurology fellows will be on call. They, they, do, they do kind of an emergency duties also, so we call them for troubleshooting. So that is the second thing. And uh, uh, so most of our neurologists are telephonic conversation. So we, we see some kind of an, uh, changes in the EEG we are not happy with. We give them a call and we have a backup, three backup plans ready. If it doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. So uh, it, it becomes a little bit kind of an easy if we have a couple of patients with the EEG monitoring. Um, but if we have too many patients, then, then it's an issue. Yeah, that so, was a nice concept as Karag was discussing. So it won't be practically possible at the out of hours for a remote com continuous monitoring by a pediatric neurologist. But at least if you can train some of our pediatric or the pediatric critical care fellows has to recognize the abnormal EEG patterns, then actually then it, it, it can act work more or less like a real time. They can capture the video and send it to the neurologist and discussion uh, can what, happen. What they say is for the intensivists, you need to understand three things, whether there is a line, whether there is a peak, whether there is a no line. So uh, you can treat three of them. Uh, that's good yeah can i can i can i yeah yeah Raj, please please welcome to uh, at what you. point i mean i just want to know because eeg is sometimes a luxury for many units uh, can you hear me 
yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. okay so uh, many of the units because some of the units do have extra well resource units if some of the units we don't have the luxury of having eeg monitoring so at what point do you insist that it is wrong to treat this patient further without eeg or uh, would you still be acceptable or if you are having to manage how do you go around i know this is very very shady question uh, but i'm trying to fit into the actual scheme of things when we look at the larger uh, situation as a country uh, who want to, who want to pick that question now um i let him okay go ahead um so i guess it depends definitely it depends on prioritizing and using your resources to the best potential that we can but i guess in an ideal world if you are putting a child on midazolam infusion for that matter then yes it would be better to have uh, continuous eeg monitoring but if you're going around uh, on an anesthetic agent and putting them on thiopentone i think it's a, i think it's you know you pretty much need to have some form of a reasonable eeg monitoring otherwise you could be doing more damage that's my take on it um so uh if the first line if you're not able to get continuous eeg monitoring at least frequent uh, eeg monitoring um and um making sure that the the burst uh, suppression are carefully looked at and not left uh, so that to drift away uh, is important so you know you would probably want around 30 seconds to a minute of um max of suppress the eeg but we know that if it is left uh, for minutes together or even half an hour etc which can easily happen with uh, when you're on multiple drugs uh, and you've got um, a, a metabolic impairment from the underlying uh, physiology whatever it is um, the drug metabolisms are not linear uh, and you don't have control over this um, you could drift away uh, accumulating barbiturates um, in the body so um unmonitored uh unmonitored use of anesthetic agents uh is probably best avoided uh, raj what yeah can i answer the darshan yeah yeah i'm good yeah yeah so this is a very valid point actually uh, what we do in a practical situation when we don't have um, eeg monitoring like sometimes even in well established let us say there are like two or three patients and sometimes there is sharing between adult patients and pediatric patient so your ambulatory eeg may be used for an adult patient and you don't have isn't it so what i believe is that uh, if you are suspecting that uh, if you are going to put a child on a midazolam infusion or a thiopentone infusion uh, you definitely need an eeg support at least to begin with because we need at least for like 2 to 3 hours to document so practically uh, sometimes we may not be able to do that ideal so called continuous eeg monitoring but in case if that's not possible at least you should try to have eeg every day till the child is receiving these infusions i know even in uh, nicus uh, when the child are put for brain cooling maneuvers even uh, that situation ideally we need a continuous eeg monitoring in a child who is like having hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy to look for subclinical seizures but even i know many units uh, in nic also do not follow this protocol of having egs so it is a tough point because uh, without uh, egs ideally going for anesthetic agents uh, is doing more harm than good as uh, dr darshan has told Please. so right even in a clinical scenario like uh, like for example if the child does not wake up from an encephalopathy and if there is a lingering encephalopathy i mean somebody was asking what was the indication in of, uh, of an eeg this becomes an indication uh, the time duration some papers have suggested somewhere between 4 to 6 hours after the anti epileptic dose if your child does not wake up you should strongly suspect a non convulsive status and a non convulsive status can also be otherwise suspected with subtle clinical manifestations like some of them would have brief twitches over their uh, eyelids some of them would have uh, brief twitches around their mouth uh, there can be like a restriction of your dolls eye movement okay there can be like intermittent runs of tachycardia or there can be intermittent runs of desaturation so i would put in one word like uh, eeg machine is like for us like a saturation probe in neurology you know like how far important is a saturation probe for us to know the uh, is there a desaturation or not likewise is an eeg uh, monitor so in an ideal world uh, i i would believe that every child who has an uh, persistent encephalopathy 
should have an EEG monitor. It gives a lot of information about the background brain activity, not only seizures, it can give an idea about whether this child would wake up from an encephalopathy, right? So there can be some good prognostic markers in the EEG, which gives me a confidence that this child would wake up once I wean off sedation. And it also helps us to pick up non-convulsive seizures, subclinical seizures, and electrographic seizures or continuous uh, seizures as well. And of course, for targeting anesthetic uh, treatment in terms of burst suppression as well, EEG is very, very useful. So I, I believe that all uh, ICU units should uh, ask their administration to push to get EEG machines because that's a very important tool uh, from neurology point of view. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Akbar. So yeah. you can take the next question as well, Dr. Akbar. What additional investigations would you plan for this particular child? In terms of etiology? Yeah, etiology. Right. Uh, like I said, told, uh, I would think uh, in the first week, there's a deterioration, the fifth day, sixth day. So you have already done a CSF. Uh, there is no pleocytosis. Uh, the sugars are normal. There is an oligoconal band, which I've been sent. So I would send a detailed serum as well as a CSF pad sample to look for autoimmune antibodies. Right. And uh, in, in, a, in a bigger children, this child is, was only seven years old. If the child was like more than 10 plus, I would also look for some solid tumors as well. So I would uh, probably screen a, a whole body PET scan to look for any uh, small solid tumors. Like you can sometimes have a testicular germ cell tumor, which could be very small. Uh, sometimes you can have, uh, let me say a small neuroblastoma, sometimes very surprisingly. Okay, or thymomas. These are some subtle tumors uh, which can produce a paraneoplastic syndrome and refractory seizures. I mean, just to complete the investigations, but I would search for uh, novel antibodies, uh, I would talk uh, to my autoimmune lab and get their help. And I would say that uh, they can probably use a tissue-based immunohistocytochemistry to look for any novel antibodies. And uh, yes, at this point, I would consider this. But if there is even a hint of suspicion for a metabolic or a genetic disease, I would proceed for at least a basic metabolic screening with the tandem mass spectrometry. And uh, yeah, if there is other points pointing towards a genetic condition, like a strong family history of epilepsy in the family, or strong family history of uh, febrile seizures in the family, or if the child had some failure to thrive or a developmental delay, I would work up for a genetic cause as well. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, I would do extensive because these are the situations where even uh, one diagnosis, even if it is rare, would be of great help in terms of prognosticating the family. And uh, it, it would convince the family much more about, about, about what we are doing. Yeah. So uh, more or less, as Akbar was discussing, we did a repeat CSF and uh, extended infectious PCR panel to make sure that no, no, none of the infections are missed, uh, missed on um, this patient. Then we did a metabolic, reasonably extensive metabolic workup. And then Darshan, I would like to um, you. Uh, I would like you to address on this. There is some re uh, renewed interest in autoimmune encephalitis. You know, this is gathering some real attention because there are enough and more of case reports even com coming from pediatric population about refractory seizures in autoimmune encephalitis. So how do you, I mean, many of the units may be still uh, not very familiar as to what sample has to be done and uh, how do you approach this case? So would you, can you just highlight what all investigations you consider important when, it, when you're thinking in terms of an autoimmune encephalitis? Um, yes, uh, thanks, Vipin. So, I, uh, from a point of view, when we're thinking of an autoimmune encephalitis and when this sort of situation, one thing is always to think, have that uh, differential in your mind. So, from a very pragmatic point of view, what we do in our unit is uh, when we do that lumbar puncture and we're not quite sure what we're going to get, is saving some sample off. You know, it's not going to do any harm. Don't send them away. Save it. Let's see what the cytology shows. Let's see what the cell shows. Let's, if the infection markers are not there, then you at least have a sample that has been taken and preserved that we can go on with your immune workup. You know, it is not cheap, these things. So you have to use these resources judiciously, but nevertheless, be prepared for it. Okay, another important point is uh, some uh, surface antibodies are better expressed in the CSF. So uh, doing an LP and not having a sample to test for the CSF markers um, will be very difficult because soon we have to go on with the next management step. Uh, but it will be very helpful to know whether it is an immune process. And the immune process can be very specific like NMDAR where you have much more uh, higher titers in the CSF. And uh, in fact, the current definition 
uh, and treatment protocol uh, necessitates you to have a CSF, um, to make the diagnosis, you need a CSF sample uh, for an NDA according to the latest guidelines. So it is important you have a sample, save it and test for important things like uh, an NDAR, uh, voltage gated potassium channels. And then uh, there are other intra neuronal antibodies where it may not be specific, but it is quite helpful like TPO or GAD, uh, where uh, there may be amper receptors. There were different uh, neuronal antibodies, but at least having an immune marker gives you the confidence of pushing ahead with your uh, treatment uh, and uh, escalating the treatment if the child is not um, uh, is not uh, improving with the first line treatment. Otherwise, there's always a doubt that if you're missing a genetic pr process, are there, is there a subtle cortical dysplasia that we are not picking up in our first MRI, which may be just limited because uh, of um, you know, practical problems. You know, if the child is unstable, we may not get all the uh, sequences that we want. It may not be thin cuts, we may miss it cortically. So all those doubts will creep in our mind as the days progress. So uh, it is very, very important, very, very useful. If there's CSF pleocytosis, and even if you don't get any antibodies, we'll still feel comfortable that we're dealing with something as long as we, we, um, as long as we make sure that there is no infectious process going on. But if it is that, that is not the case, then having some surrogate markers, even if it is not the actual neuronal antibodies, is quite helpful in taking the management forward. So that is one thing I would like to share. So the takeaway is that, sir, there are certain autoimmune markers like NMDA and VJKC are very specific for CRM for CSF antibody. But then there are some antibodies like GAD and TPO may be pretty much non-specific and would tell you just that some kind of autoimmune process is going on in the child. And would you want to comment on this repeat MRI? As we said, the first MRI was essentially normal. This was the second MRI, MRI and uh, is there something interesting to be pointed out? So as we can see um, on the coronal uh, and the axial cuts, there are bilateral uh, T2 hyperintensities uh, that are seen um, subcortically. And uh, this is not very specific, but it, it tells you there is some inflammation going on. So whether it is secondary cytotoxic because of the, all the prolonged seizures the child had for the last 30 days, or whether it is um, an active uh, inflammatory process um, going on in the brain is anybody's guess. Um, but it at least gives you uh, that a clue that there is something inflammatory going on and we need to uh, probably which line of treatment we need to take. Great. So moving, uh, moving on with our case, can I, can I uh, yeah, ask yeah, a quick question? See, uh, if I can't do a panel of investigation for specific cost reasons and other things, how do you prioritize investigation? Because we, uh, in our country, when most of the time it is out of pocket payments, I can, uh, can't ask them to do a whole set of investigations, which are many times many expensive, metabolic and other autoimmune panel screening and all. So do you have any kind of prioritization to tell us, okay, let me do tier one, tier two. Is there anything like that? Or um, is there any, any tips you can give us on a little bit of uh, rationalization of investigation? Um, I think there are some basic bare minimums I want. I want to know whether it is a treatable infectious thing like HSV1 or 2. That is one thing I definitely want out of my way. So that will be in my definite tier one. Um, and you know the culture and sensitivity, if the child has been drug knife well and good, but often they are not. They would have had the first do dose of antibiotics. So a, a reasonable panel looking for, you know, uh, if the CSF gives us a clue of infection, um, then that is, our life is easy, even if it can just stick to the cultures. But if it is not uh, there, then at least ruling out HSV is very, very important. That is how I see it. The rest of the things, if you can't do it, I think there is the, nothing to lose in moving on with your management and, and escalating uh, uh, your immune therapy, your first line immune therapy. So there's nothing holding you off uh, from giving you IVIG, for example, uh, and uh, methylprednisolone as well. So if you think, uh, even if you have a suspicion that you are not absolutely able to differentiate whether this is a you know, viral 
uh, infection, there is no need to hold back. So you can you can take your CSF that is not very expensive, do the cytology, and at least try and rule out HSV one and two. Okay. So with that, yeah. So with that, the evidence, Raj, you asking something? No, no. I was asking your opinion as well. Yeah. So um, uh, the only thing is that uh, initially all these autoimmune encephalitis manifestations could be very non-specific. They could have just some, you know, seizures with the behavioral disturbances, and then they can go on to deteriorate. So I mean, ideally, uh, it would have been uh, very nice for us to say that uh, probably we can just look at uh, herpes simplex virus and uh, NMDA receptor antibodies, and probably we can check for the rest of them later. Uh, but it doesn't happen like this because even the other uh, autoimmune encephalitis, be it GABA A receptor or GABA B receptor or AMPA or potassium gated channels, all of them almost uh, have the same clinical manifestations like some seizures and behavioral changes. So, but the having said that, uh, does not or not to send testing or not to send antibodies does not um, prevent us from starting empirical, uh, you know, immunotherapy with the steroids and IBIG. So if you have a strong degree of clinical suspicion that this is not infection, this is probably an autoimmune encephalitis. As Dr. Darshan told, we can save the CSF sample and we can empirically start the therapy. Okay. And then probably if possible, we can, uh, you know, send the samples to either research labs or either medical colleges or any other way we can try to look for the other antibodies. Because one of the reasons that we are looking for these so-called cell surface antibodies is also to prognosticate the children. We know that these children would have a good prognosis and these sort of antibodies do not have such a good prognosis as well. So it's an unfortunate situation, a practical situation. Uh, but given a chance, I would rather save the CSF sample and uh, look for the antibodies rather than not looking for it, actually. This is my take on it. Yeah. Great. So thanks for sharing the wisdom. So moving on yeah. with this case, as we already discussed, we started him on IVIG and pulse methyl prednisolone, which didn't do much good. His seizures were sent and there was no loss, I mean, regaining consciousness in between. So we started him on levetiracetam, which was already there, which was increased to the maximum dose. Phenytoin was confirmed to be in the therapeutic range. And then we moved on with the anesthetic agent, IV thiopentone, after loading dose was started on, uh, started and was increased to a ma uh, dose of maximum 4 mg per kg per hour. So as uh, we already have seen uh, that this patient is already started on immunotherapy. So uh, for uh, Akbar, can you just tell us, I mean, you know, these tests are not very commonly available. The antibodies, uh, even I think for all practical purposes, the turnaround time of the CSF antibodies to come back would be a minimum of 48 to 72 hours. So yeah. if you have a high suspicion of, uh, say autoimmune encephalitis, how early would you initiate an immunotherapy? No, no, that's what I said. I mean, um, it is as early as possible. It could be even the first day of hospital admi admission, actually, uh, speaking really. I mean, it all depends upon your uh, uh, clinical judgment. Like if you feel that this child, uh, you have done a CSF and it's not that much pleocytic or there's not much of hypoglycorrhacia and you feel it is uh, more of a non-specific encephalitis, uh, with a, a, a biphasic course, you feel that the child is having a deterioration in the second week. There have been instances where I have started uh, IV methyl pred and IVAG on first day of hospitalization as well. What is more important here is that uh, your CSF and your EEG and MRI are paraclinical investigations, meaning by that one of these investigations uh, at least should be abnormal and that can give us a confidence for you to go for uh, immunomodulation. If your CSF is normal, if your EEG is also normal, and if your MRI is also normal, which is very less likely because most of these patients would have at least one thing abnormal, either the EEG showing some non-specific slowing or focal seizures, then I would go ahead and start uh, immunotherapy as early as possible. It could be the first day, second day, or the third day. Because here, early and aggressive immunomodulation definitely does make a difference uh, if there is some sort of autoimmune or inflammatory pathology. Right. right. And then uh, next question again from a PIC point would be very important. So there is a whole lot of discussion on which anesthetic agents uh, would be the preferable. You mean uh, between uh, thiopentone or again, Akbar will be in a position to say there's a unique AIMS protocol like high dose phenobarbitone coma, ketamine. So how do you pick and choose for, a, I mean, is that is there a definite 
algorithm based uh, age and iv anesthetic when it comes to refractory seizure or is it like based on a unit experience so can we ask yeah. uh, the yeah. participants or units yes. around what their practices are exactly abdul rauf is there actually rauf is yeah. there i think Please. so Uh, I think Raj, you can actually. Uh, ask. Yes. Uh, hello. Rao. Yes, yeah. Rao. Go ahead. Yeah. Ah uh, yes. Ah uh, yes, sir. Uh, so uh, I'll just uh, uh, put forward my experience, sir. Uh, in Gangaram, uh, in uh, while I was uh, practicing in Gangaram, we were using uh, ketamine as the second line anesthetic agent. That's after midazolam as anesthesia. We were using ketamine, and uh, and uh, uh, we have fairly used in around twenty to thirty patient with a uh, good success. We didn't do a controlled study as such. and uh, there are some advantages uh, both theoretical and practical uh, one advantage is uh, we all know that in um, uh, in status there is a down regulation of, or there is a saturation of the gaba receptors and there is a progression of the nmda receptors in that way it helps and the other way it helps is uh, it helps to negate the adverse hemodynamic effects of the midazolam so it uh, uh, it help in a way to get away without uh, using a uh, process okay i know if you ask me the evidence uh, the uh, randomized trials as such uh, but there are around 200 cases reported as case series or case reports which have reported some benefits and there is a large trial uh, uh, rct going on in a italian cohort of around 60 children uh, it is a ketaser trial i think the results will be out in this december and there is a large trial going on in adults also the results are again awaited um, so i think uh, the ketamine is upcoming now Uh, so okay. uh, after coming from gangaram we are now using in uh, in our unit also or past one year in three patients we have used ketamine okay i saw satish uh, mims uh, is satish in i uh, uh, hi satish yeah what is your 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 choice first line anesthetic agent yeah hello raj Raj, it's Parag. Yeah, it's Parag. Ah, hey Parag, hey Parag, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So now I I wanted to ask. Uh, so when we are uh, thinking about using this ketamine, uh, uh, Abdul is uh, probably listening. So what happens when we give a bolus of ketamine? Because the bolus of ketamine achieves a very kind of a high concentration of ketamine in the body when we give like a one milligram or two milligrams per kilo. What exactly happens? These kids are on the EEG or not? a bolus dose of a ketamine is causing a suppression of a seizures or not or they are actively seizing because if a bolus dose is not doing a miracle what do you feel escalating doses of the medication is going to do anything um this no. is directed to probably rao yeah uh, sir um, uh, is i think sir the ketamine has some theoretically also it has anti epileptic activity and uh, i j- i just told about there it's uh, there are at least 200 reports in children uh, even even there is a case series of around 10 kids also and um, uh, uh, no, i what, think it, it has rob rob this is more of a practical question than more of a literature based question but our because, question is because, if the uh, goal is of ketamine is not terminating seizures is there any point on going on an escalating dose of ketamine did i frame that question right parag Yeah. So yeah. what happens? Let it be. Uh, Midazolam has been utilized. Now you're thinking about starting ketamine, and let it be. Uh, some person comes and says, uh, "Give a good bolus of ketamine." So uh, I, I know there are no not much of a side effects. I will take care of that. I gave. Let it be two milligrams per kilo, and I could not see there is a change in the seizure. Child is clinically seizing, and there is no changes in the EEG activity. <laughs> Does it make sense in giving a uh infusion for 24 hours or probably 18 hours 12 hours to see that we don't have an effect of ketamine when i give a good bolus of uh, uh ketamine and uh, i would say uh, again offline i've seen a lot of patients who doesn't respond so probably akbar might be remembering few patient uh, epilepsy or partial discontin and all those things they don't respond to midazolam and all those kind of a stuff and they suddenly they will respond to ketamine so what i wanted to say is there is a cohort of patient who actually i feel like that and probably other people can clear that if you give a bolus a good bolus of ketamine and they are actually responding to that then then it makes sense to continue that but if it, there is no change in anything does it make say, seeing like giving a 5 microgram then giving a bolus and going to the 10 microgram and then 15 microgram what do you feel yeah, about yeah. that uh, yes sir i understand your question sir so you mean that we can choose patient for the ketamine might work yes, i think that's your yes. point yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
uh, uh, maybe sir but uh, I, i told you, in our experience we have seen uh, a good number of patients we have where we have tried ketamine and uh, we were doing only intermittent eeg and uh, we could attain birth, birth suppression and we could maintain birth suppression also my my my, uh, yeah. my question or worry is at the end of the day Right. If you are going to the ketamine, be ready with the probably a fourth in line. And, and if you ask me, we'll come to that. Okay. Uh, if you ask me, very cheaper version which is available most of the time, we are able to manage, which is uh, gases. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll read there. We'll read there, Parag. <laughs> Parag, I think okay. we can also take the last question there. What all frequent problems would you encounter? and would you consider in when it comes to the side effect part would you consider one is better than other in terms of the toxicity profile say between so, ketamine to, to, uh, thiopentone high dose phenobarbitone and uh, yeah. what else um, so uh, right. when you are con- when, so first problem would be uh, problem related to the neurologist which yeah. <laughs> probably we <laughs> know okay uh, intensive care and the neurologist and second thing is the a problem uh, related to uh, anesthetic agent so remember uh, uh, it's a kind of a continuous process and uh, uh, if raj will say abdul will say we have seen so many patient who are on good doses of theopentone but rock stable and uh, we have seen a lot of patient you give a 1 mg per kilo bolus and they are crashing so few things we have to uh, understand about them is one is a kind of an indirect effect which comes because of loss of a tone uh, probably uh, making them flaccid so pulling of a uh, blood circulation and relative uh, the distribution of blood goes off so kind of a distributive shock then second is uh, negative inotropic effect of this medications uh, and third is then again it comes kind of a i would say uh, literature based that they decrease the engulfment of uh, probably neutrophils chances make them secondary immunodeficient and other thing which comes with this kind of anesthetic packages probably bowel and bladder care which is very very important and if you ask me most of us miss that that uh, this most of the anesthetics actually decreases the gut motility so and these patients are okay so most of them are fed so we have to take care of the feeding nutrition and another comes which which is a really really important problem is a change in a position because a lot of these kids have a raised icp so using uh, air beds second thing is a uh, wap bundle care because they're going to be actually intubated for pretty long time we need a long line probably a pick line or a central line so make it sure that when you are suspecting somebody is going to go on midazolam and ketamine it is better to get a big kind of a nice pick line because chances of infection are less third thing is uh, uh, again it's going to come over the time if you really feel you going to come out of the situation early so uh, i would say uh, then probably raj would also agree tracheostomy non tracheostomy so these are the few things which come as a package with this kind of a patient rather than an individual thing that more or less answers Uh, the pediatric intensivist problems were related to anesthetic so, uh, regarding iv anesthetics sir, can i is, uh, can i add something uh, sorry satish satish yes i'm going to go ahead yeah i'm going to go ahead yeah yeah so regarding iv anesthetics i think uh, i mean having heard all the points regarding ketamine and everything the answer is very simple i mean if you look at all the iv anesthetics whether it is thiopentone or high dose phenobarbitone or iv ketamine there are no strong guidelines or evidence just to say that this is better than this etc so if your unit protocol of if your unit is comfortable with one particular agent please stick on with it i think that should be the most important message like if you are used to thiopentone loading followed by maintaining thiopentone infusion please stick on to it like like there some one other thing that i have used recently and uh, for last 3 to 4 years is high dose phenobarbitone where we give a phenobarbitone up to 40 to 80 mg per kg in a day with birth suppression my logic was that it was easy to maintain phenobarbitone as a maintenance drug and i could slowly uh, withdraw and slowly taper phenobarbitone over like 2 to 3 weeks so i was comfortable with high dose phenobarbitone because personally i felt with thiopentone when you are trying to wean off thiopentone there were more relapsing clinical seizures which uh, luckily or fortunately did not happen with uh, few cases i had managed with high dose phenobarbitone therapy having said that if you are comfortable with a uh, ketamine infusion uh, it does work in some patients we cannot predict which patients because it has a theoretical advantage as dr abdul rauf told but if you are comfortable with that protocol please stick on to a ketamine uh, infusion protocol for like 2 to 3 days and then try to be enough so there is nothing like this has to be done or this has to be given that should be the answer i think so yeah Uh, yeah yeah can i uh, can i add yes, something yeah yes, 
Yeah, so this is kind of stressing both Akbar's and Parag's uh, points. Like after a certain point, we some drugs work for some patients. We cannot exactly. say that this is the exactly. best drug. Exactly. First of all, and then the, probably everybody starts with medazone because that's kind of the safest right. drug. Right. And then the only important thing which we should remember is that these should, patients should always be on EEG monitoring. Exactly. And we know that the drug works or not. First of all. And we should not be wasting a lot of time. Let's say start metazolam in the morning and then kind of find out it's not working the next day morning. So if it doesn't work, we probably should go to the next drug which we are comfortable using. And then we should have, if you start ketamine, yes, give a bolus, start an infusion. It doesn't work, we will know. We will know in five, 10 minutes. And then you can step up and then we have a range. Probably we go for some time and then if it doesn't work, go to the next drug which you're comfortable with. That's that's a very important thing. Rather than uh, kind of uh, discussing which is the best drug, uh, you should be using your, the drug which you're comfortable with, and you yeah. should use EEG monitoring, and you should escalate as quickly as possible. Exactly. That's a valid procedures. That's a valid. Point. That's a valid point. I, I I think I completely agree with uh, the statements. One of the common mistake people do is to wait on a lower dose. Yes. Uh, for it to kick in. So I think that has been highlighted. Uh, would you start at a higher dose of medizolam and come down? De-escalate or escalate medizolam? And how much do you escalate? Yeah. Like maximum till you moving on with the next drug? Yeah. I know so, my, yeah, sorry. My experience is to start with uh, three mics per kg per minute as, at least and then escalate. But you can even start with five mics per kg per minute or six mics per kg per minute and escalate up to quickly up to 18 mics per kg per minute as Dr. Satish told, okay, you stand there close to your monitor and watch like every 10 to 15 minutes, you can escalate your metazolam till there is some control or suppression. Yeah. So that's one, one point we want to reiterate. Start at a higher dose, yes, stand yes. at the bedside and yes. Uh, yes. escalate it every 10 to 15 minutes to achieve. Uh, yeah. yeah. An another thing I wanted to make it sure that uh, Akbar, you might clear also this. Yes. Uh, so what happens in the ICU? What Raj said is very important. We should have a timeline. Like I started with three and I I'm going to go to the 18. So I have okay. a six parts to go up. So right. how are you going to manage? You're going to manage in two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. There is no standard guidelines for that. But what yeah. I know is I wanted to get rid of the seizures. So yeah. what Dr. Satish said, that is very important. I want an EEG there. Yes. Second thing is it should be ASAP. I mean, by the end of six, seven hours, you should say, okay, I have given everything. Midazolam is in. All those things are in, nothing is working. And both things, uh, which, which uh, probably Akbar said, remember, uh, I, again, I, I do practice that and probably Akbar might change it. So when you are going from three mics to five mics, you are not changing too much of concentration. Okay, it is just mics. Okay. And if you actually calculate the dose, it comes like a peanuts. So remember that you have to give a bolus and go up. Exactly. It's not like from three to four, you are going to go give a bolus 0.1 milligrams per kilo and go to the six, seven, eight, whatever you wanted to go. Right. I agree with it. I agree with it. Parag, yeah. okay. I mean, you, you can give intermittent uh, short acting uh, benzodiazepines or barbiturate boluses when you're escalating your continuous infusion. It is pretty much a standard practice. Actually, it is recommended in fact. So whenever a child is on a continuous infusion, whatever it is, even if the child is on continuous high dose phenobarbitone therapy, you can actually use an intermittent short acting barbiturate like thiopentone as a, as a loading dose. Even that has been recommended by uh, some colleagues and some papers. So as you said, if, if the child is on a midazolam continuous infusion, you can give short boluses and then quickly escalate to the next infusion dose, which is agreed upon. Yeah. Great. So there are so many valid points discussed. Right. Uh, I think we'll come back to the case now. So with thiopentone of 4 uh, mg per kg per hour, we achieved an intermittent burst suppression with no clinical seizures. But then as time progressed, child inevitably, it, uh, it had to happen. She started showing features of hypertension, gram-negative culture. So we were forced to taper thiopentone. And before that, we added so uh, sodium valproate and oscarbamazepine. So, but then from 4 to 2 uh, mg per kg per hour, then child started getting clinical and electrographic seizures. They again became super refractory. So ketamine infusion was added and this and was escalated to the maximum dose of 40 microgram per kg per minute. And then uh, thiopendone was gradually again weaned and discontinued. So at this point, we started on plasma pheresis and ketogenic diet were uh, introduced in um, one after other as seen sequentially. So I think the ketamine discussion, the infusion part, we have already discussed. Darshan, uh, how 
I mean, although ketogenic diet is so much discussed, right. even considered as a part of pharmacotherapy uh, in the practice, area, but practically, how practical is to introduce and uh, sustain ketosis in refractory seizures? Your experience. Uh, so, from my personal experience, I have struggled with ketogenic diet for multiple reasons. Uh, they've always tried to initiate it, uh, but it has never been sort of week one or so. You know, maybe we should change, or maybe I should change practice from that point of view. What happens is often uh, with these children, when we're thinking about an immune encephalopathy, uh, we are, uh, they're already on steroids. So they've already had the lethal prednisolone, and we are maintaining them on steroids. So that may be, you know, at least one mg per kg of. Uh, steroids. So that itself is a very gluconeogenic process and there is often lack of glucose control. So to achieve uh, ketosis, which we need to achieve for the ketogenic diet uh, is uh, difficult when you have uh, a, a gluconeogenic process that is being triggered artificially running in parallel. Uh, the second point is uh, often it comes down after an anesthetic agent. And as uh, a lot of uh, people were alluding to, there is a significant gut side effect from these anesthetic agents. They often go into paralytic ileus. Uh, they don't tolerate the ketogenic diet very well. But having said that, there is a lot of evidence in the literature where there are you know, case reports uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, even case series uh, where a ketogenic diet has worked, but I think there are significant practical issues with uh, achieving ketosis and whether it is one is to three, one is to four. I haven't been able to go more than one is to four because they just don't tolerate it. Uh, and uh, we struggle to get ketosis, but nevertheless, we try and persevere with it. Dr. Akbar, your take on it, because most of the times, as we were discussing, there are bowel-related issues, particularly. So do you, uh, what is your take on it? No, no, no. You... I completely agree with uh, Darshan what told, but uh, given a chance... I wanted to ask, like, uh, if some literature says, like, if oral or enteral route of ketogenic diet, is, sometimes you can achieve the desired ketosis with IV uh, ketogenic uh, preparation. So uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, I've not used an IV ketogenic diet. I'm not sure whether it is available at all, first of all, in India. But uh, what we had was ketocal powders, that is oral ketogenic diet. And uh, as rightly said by Dr. Darshan, once we have given uh, steroids, there is a high degree of you know, gluconeogenesis going on. It is practically impossible to achieve ketosis, you know. Uh, but sometimes, you know, with, uh, with topiramate with you or sometimes with astrozolamide with you, you can try to achieve ketosis. I have tried that. But in the presence of uh, paralytic ileus with, uh, you know, gut motility being so much hampered because of your IV anesthetic agents, uh, giving a ketogenic diet could be very tricky. The child can have significant, um, you know, gut malabsorption and gut ileus and so and so. So it is very difficult. But having said that, uh, ketogenic diet has been recommended by many so-called uh, papers and colleagues that it should be started as early as possible. At least you should try to start as early as possible like within the first or the second week of having a super refractory status. But it has not worked uh, for me personally. And it, there are a lot of practical challenges here. Right. So I, I think, think we are, uh, shall I, uh, we are running a short of time. I think we, we are already yeah. close one hour, 10 minutes. Exactly. So, so we'll go through the rest of the presentation and then keep the question of answer, question answer sessions towards the end. So this patient was then uh, given plasma pheresis. I think most of the units would de definitely consider plasma pheresis after IVIT. So can you uh, just tell us from your experience, Akbar and uh, Darshan, would, what would be the ideal time? Say like, I know it's very difficult. Yeah, Darshan but... can answer. Yeah, Darshan, please. Yeah. Um, so a very pragmatic point of view. We just don't want to uh, wash away what you've given in the form of IVIG, which is very expensive. And you need to give enough time for the, uh, for the IVIG to work. Um, by binding to the antibodies that circulating and, get, and the body being able to get rid of it. Um, if you do it too soon, then you wash away the IVIG you have given. So at least wait for a week is uh, what I would take. Um, ideally, if you uh, you know, but if you know, ideally two weeks would be a good time. But sometimes you don't have that luxury, and you may just need to push on uh, and uh, get on with your plasma paralysis. 
fine. So uh, for this particular patient, we didn't find any uh, significant improvement with ketamine, even plasmapheresis we couldn't. We initially planned for five cycles, but then we had to stop it after three so, cycles. So Bipin, I can add on one of the thing with plasmapheresis yeah. is that we are uh, not, we are reluctant as clinicians to go for plasmapheresis because of invasiveness. Indeed. And if there is a antibody positivity, actually probably it gives us more confidence. Like if there is an NMDA positive or some, uh, some GABA positive, then it is probably, you know, uh, logical or more confident for us to say, okay, there's an antibody positive encephalitis. So let us try to wash out or remove the antibody by plasmapheresis. But uh, I mean, but actually speaking, plasmapheresis is uh, equally effective for your zero negative autoimmune encephalitis as well. One of the major reasons that we don't use is uh, reluctance and uh, it being invasive in children. Yeah. So one thing to add, uh, Dr. Pippin, is uh, plasma pheresis. If you have a kid more than 30 kg of age, yes, or sorry, sorry weight, better so than my plasma pheresis. Plasma pheresis is much cheaper uh, than, than IVH. IVH. Exactly. Yeah. So a cycle of plasma pheresis might cost you around 20, 30 thousand rupees. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just saying approximately, but IVH is very costly. Completely agree. So and, for bigger obese yes. children, plasma pheresis is always better than IVH going for IVH. Yeah. That was a very valid practical point. So for this particular patient, we couldn't actually find much benefit with ketamine, which was again tapered and stopped. So then we did try with propofol. I know the evidence in pediatrics for propofol is not very huge, but then some point in time we tried propofol, which didn't work out for this patient. And then was in fact started restarted on thiopinone, which seemed to be the only drug which worked for him. And along with that, we actually, before tapering thiopendone, we introduced phenobarbitone as Sakbo was previously discussing. And then we moved on with the biologicals, rituximab. And then also added the so-called newer fancy drugs like parampenil and lacosamide. So in the next slide, we would ask you, uh, Akbar, your experience with uh, utility of newer agents of uh, uh, refractory seizures. Like again, again, uh, there are no guidelines or uh, no evidences to say that uh, this works or doesn't work. The only logic I have is that at least try all antiepileptics with the different modes of action. I mean, that is the logic of uh, giving lacosamide and parampanel. Parampanel works through ampar receptors and, uh, you know, lacosamide works through so, 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 uh, slow sodium channel inactivation and so on and so so we don't know, really don't know whether it is the anti-epileptic which is making a difference or whether it is the natural process of this uh, super refractory status epilepticus which sort of uh, settles down. So we are uh, really in a catch-22 situation where you have tried like four or five anti-epileptics and you want to try the sixth and the seventh one. So does it really make big difference? Uh, I, I don't think so, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Darshan, um, would you consider any newer biological as like rituximab? Have you come across any specific scenarios where um, you would consider biologicals like rituximab or IL-6 inhibitors? Um, so uh, like, rituximab is not considered new anymore sort of thing. You know, most of us are now using it very routinely. Um, only again, uh, it, it, it has the same problem of IVIG when you're considering it uh, alongside uh, plasma pheresis, because it, it draws a bit ferrest out if you it's a monoclonal antibody. So that that is there. Uh, so with I don't have personally much experience with tocilizumab. Uh, we have used it once in an ANEC patient, uh, acute necrotizing encephalitis, and uh, there was not much benefit. Um, we have some experience using Anakindra in, uh, in Westmead um, and this was part of the research study um, and this where the cohort itself was very difficult it was a super refractory uh, and our yield wasn't particularly good. Um, discussing with uh, Dr. Vinayan here in Amrita, I think they've used it uh, on a couple of occasions where they have tried to import the drug uh, and his experience wasn't particularly um, particularly good. But and these are very limited studies. So I think overall, there isn't a magic bullet for these things. Um, you can try, uh, but at least with rituximab, we have a much more experience. So that will definitely be my first uh, uh, line among those newer, so-called newer uh, uh, biological agents. Um, and uh, maybe with the, with the COVID, uh, we may get a bit more experience with tocilizumab and have more uh, experience with that. But yes, that is that is my take on it. I think before concluding the discussion on IV anesthetic, uh, brief discussion, if at all any units are using propofol, um, again, propofol is 
not to decide i mean there are so many concerns of propofol infusion syndrome cardiac failure abdominalis on anybody akbar at some point in time you had a personal preference of propofol over ketamine or thiopentone if at all or else is, is it something which is oh, very no no um, no recent experience with propofol long 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 ago when i was in pj i remember some patients used to come with propofol to our er emergency maybe parag uh, i am not sure anybody recently used propofol because we so, are worried about uh, propofol infusion syndrome yeah right yeah i think so, i'll take the opportunity i don't know whether agba will remember we had a propofol infusion syndrome like syndrome on no, a no, that was ketamine. exactly that was very very interesting on ketamine infusion we had propofol infusion like syndrome with uh, lactic acidosis hypertriglyceridemia and all those things okay. we don't know how to explain so, it yeah yeah so when we went back and looked at the literature there was case reports yeah propofol exactly. infusion syndrome like syndrome yes exactly with ketamine with ketamine yeah So that puts us uh, puts uh, us at this point at least that uh, between ketamine and uh, thiopentone maybe both I mean, it's just a unit preference but propofol may not be the first choice of IV anesthetic I think that is the way we can put it and then now comes to the sorry, one word about the, um, one about the isoflurane I think we are not discuss isoflurane okay uh, so we had uh, one patient whom we manage with isoflurane with good effect. um after akbar leaving um so uh, what is the experience with other other team members uh, isoflurane i know akbar uh, doesn't vouch for it uh, parag was uh, sharing so, his experience in rainbow with the use of isoflurane yeah so uh, first of all i'll answer about this uh, propofol and i think so all of our intensivist and the neurologist will agree that when you land up in a desperate situation we do try a bolus of propofol forget about infusion but we definitely give a bolus of propofol that's one thing second thing is about uh, refractive so uh, one thing i wanted to ask you a question uh, we have a definition very clear about a super refractory refractory status epilepticus but we don't have actually kind of a timeline when we gonna jump on some medication so that that's always lacking like when to Uh, stock midazolam so we we are talk, talking about a very complicated situation when we are on midazolam and we started ketamine how we going to taper down midazolam or uh, 2 hours 3 hours or are we going to stop it because it has not worked then we have a ketamine we are on 40 mics are we going to stop ketamine or are we going to be in like 25 25% so these are all sketchy areas where probably most of us will will follow some kind of a things but it's it's not like a uh, kind of a ruler like i'm going to follow that then third thing which is very important is Uh, what Ra- uh, Raja's uh, leptect isoflurane. So, how what do we think about isoflurane? So, I would tell from ICO point of view, we should jump on isoflurane by the end of 24 hours because enough trial has been done by that time that we have tried ketamine, we have tried midazolam, and we are struggling. We are trying to use the medication which are we are not comfortable with or we don't know. We don't once in a while we are using those medication. Now, if you talk about isoflurane, how it helps from financially as well as uh, medication point of view. i would share my experience of like almost uh, i would say 14 patients so uh, we have kind of a compiled data for our eight patients so in the moment we start uh, uh, isoflurane we had a burst suppression it's not never happened that uh, we didn't get a burst suppression second thing is the average duration ranges from 2 days to 18 days okay so from, we have a patient who responded on 2 days and 18 days and they did stay in the hospital because of comorbid things like uh, tracheostomy infection and all those things and most of them are kind of a, a i would say autoimmune encephalitis from icu point of view how it helps again we are not having any other things so we can take care of the side effects second thing is if we get a boil separators into the icu so now you can separate the ventilator from the patient so uh, again i'll talk about cost cutting also so the ventilatory charges are waived off because you have a boil separators and a 48 hours of medication of isoflurane cost 2000 rupees so you can imagine uh, so cost cutting wise is also very important so i think so if we have kind of a availability or probably i would say uh, uh, infrastructure where can you can pull up the boil separators and start isoflurane it is good to try in the first 24 hours rather than just lingering around and saying because we, we it's like a high frequency i would say raj that we know that there is a hypoxia and we know that there is nothing we can try we are, we are in front of a wall so try to uh, use isoflurane early than a late and they do well and hemodynamics will be very well taken care of you don't have to start any sedative measures 
everything has been taken care of a lot of medications come out of the patients and uh, financially is also actually uh, pretty good one question parag uh, uh, the yeah. one case we manage i, I think we had a very similar experience we were up achieved burst suppression very quickly and found to be very effective but then with one patient experience i can't vouch for it so I the, uh, but i just i've only read about isoflurane what about hepatotoxicity and other uh, side effects so most most of our patient didn't had anything so i'll tell you uh, just briefly about cases so most of the case almost all the cases were more than 6 antiepileptics when we started uh, uh, isoflurane uh most of them received immunomodulation in the form of steroid and some of them received cyclosporine also and rituximab so isoflurane was initiated pretty late in most of the patient except the one patient we went very uh, rapidly on day 2 uh average mac required was ranging from 1 to maximum of 2.6 one child and uh, so we are, we are, so most of them required dinotrops so after uh, starting isoflurane i am just reading from my mobile so uh, almost uh, all of them required dinotrops after starting the uh, isoflurane but none of them had a hepatotoxicity great so thank you uh, parag for that was a really nice discussion and uh, we have just touched on one and a half hours after starting and yeah. it's really surprised to still still see 45 participants still with us so let's just complete the discussion i know the next question is a bit uh, it's not straight forward at all so how much to accept is a big question in these kind of scenarios especially in a corporate hospital you know and i have seen you there since spending hours uh, on family counseling so uh, how, how do you kick a balance between okay salvageability expectations and then how far should we go how do you I mean it's not a one sentence answer but then if you can just Right. Uh, so i think um, you know i think we have to be brutally honest with our pa uh, parents uh, and tell them you know that this is a very guarded prognosis um, tell them what we what we see um, often uh, in, in in a lot of scenarios the, the this is sort of uh, the child uh, itself will take whichever direction the child wants to take uh, whether it is uh, good or bad Uh, but if we are in limbo and we are really struggling, that we have to be brutally honest with them and tell them the outcomes are not particularly encouraging. You know, we are, uh, just less than fifty percent of the patients will have um, significant uh, neurological uh, morbidity at the end of uh, if they survive and come out of this. Uh, and often they are on multiple antiepileptic drugs for a reasonable period of time. Yes, there's a small percentage who do well, um, and. Um, Uh, but we have to discuss with them and often uh, we let take cues from the parents as to which way they want to go uh, and in this case uh, they absolutely wanted us to keep, carry on with every single possible thing and some people may not want to do that um, and may not want to uh, they may have uh, different reasons for making a choice so it is having that open discussion and then uh, uh, taking it forward okay Akbar, anything, any add-ons, or should we? No, no, no. It is the same as Darshan. I agree with them. You have to be very honest, and uh, sometimes it is uh, advisable to accept our own shortcomings. You know, you have to accept. We have to be so honest to say that we are just trying, and uh, and uh, we have to take cues from the parents. Very rightly said. Yeah. One, one thing from ICU point of view, I wanted to add. Yeah. Yeah. So when we are counseling, we have to be very, very clear exactly. that. we have to use the terminology whether child will be able to see talk understand uh, whether so like you can use whether your child will be the same as before whether he will be to run uh, uh, whatever it is you you see the area damaged and be realistic and you can't say like that he will have some motor changes he will have some vision problems you tell them clearly whether he will be able to communicate see eat walk talk to talk because that will have an impact rather than talking about uh, kind of uh, things and third third thing which is very important and raj will also agree don't talk in a percentage that there is a 50% improvement in the seizure 2% improvement in the seizure don't talk about it um i think counseling uh, families like this has been the most most difficult thing i think uh, i needed counseling after counseling them that was <laughs> how difficult they were uh, last patient if i can remember i would have spoken to at least 15 doctors from outside i got a infectious disease consultant calling me from australia for information there is a neurosurgeon calling from uk for uh, patient's condition and giving me inputs 
and then this patient insisted on a second opinion by a senior intensivist i don't know whether you will believe dr balaram chandran flight in from chennai to see this patient to give the family a second opinion so it has been that difficult and uh, uh, but then as you told sometimes it is sometimes hard for the family to keep motivated and ourselves to keep motivated and the cost factors that's a entirely different issue how long when we go along this journey we don't know how much it is going to cost and without without unpredictable outcome is a tough challenge and uh, if the family is on board with us uh, to a reasonable limit then we can do whatever science allows us to do uh, but still we need to do things what we need to do great so now let me take you through all the last few slides so we had all textbook complications for this patients had hypotension sepsis uh, asthmatobacter pneumonia recurring multi mdr antibiotic regime pseudomembranous colitis so initially paralytic ileus then subsequently pseudomembranous colitis then ketosis as we already said was difficult to be attained and sustained had critical illness muscle wasting neuropathy myopathy and had all tubes in he was actually the he stayed in our unit for more than 40 day 50 days of which more than 40 days were invasive ventilation so he required tracheostomy feeding tubes cpn and also these are all bread and butter so this is how he was just one day prior to the discharge so luckily he came through and this was the amazing that's when this was the amazing at first follow up right just i follow up this is about you know 7 months down the line okay so this was after two i mean like one of the recent videos he was coming up for follow up in opd so let me just quickly go through the take home messages and i think then we will open up the forum for final discussions and i think ajay has been keeping track of all queries from the um, chat box if at all so the main take homes would be we need to act fast so once benzodiazepines become refractory then it is going to be a nightmare so among iv medications uh, midazolam and definitely has the highest level of evidence and the best treatment response so far super refractory seizures has to be managed in specialized icus under um, eeg monitoring and continuous eeg monitoring with the remote mon uh, neurology Uh, supervision is desirable if you are thinking in terms of autoimmune encephalitis don't wait for the csf reports to come back you can start early immunotherapy and as everybody were contributing so you act fast hit hard so time is very important to get hold of the seizure and then you can always de escalate rather than going in very in bits and pieces so hit hard achieve seizure control then you can always de escalate that's what i could gather from it intensive perspective so anything else from the panel and then we'll move on uh, to others if any uh, i think uh, there is a great uh, team work from both of you so vipin and uh, darshan great work but what makes me more feel good is that you know we are as a state in the kerala we are getting more and more equipped to manage really really difficult intensive care issues so these are encouragement for rest everybody in the state take up challenging cases discuss improve our knowledge and make sure that we give our best for children and uh, maybe few years back the we would have lost all those children now that we are bringing them bringing them back so that is a one one big step forward for all of us together uh, so i would uh, open the forum for questions uh, to the panelists ajay if you are still with us if you can read out the questions then that would be easy Yes, actually, the one of the questions I already had asked that is regarding the hypothermia and the other unconventional things. Once we are, uh, once we are stuck in the uh, refractive issues, therapeutic uh, hypothermia. Yeah. Yes, sir. No, so uh, the experiences of therapeutic hypothermia is again uh, very sketchy only. Um, if at all we want to keep somewhere between thirty-two to thirty-four. for like 24 to 48 hours the idea rationally is that it reduces the cerebral metabolic rate and theoretically it can bring down your uh, seizure activity but having said that uh, if you try to achieve therapeutic hypothermia you have to look for other complications like hypotension sometimes coagulopathy sometimes dic and so on and so so interestingly what uh, we had uh, um, observed was that when we went for an high dose phenobarbital therapy 
as a protocol to burst suppression there was also a, a hypothermia secondary to erfinobarbitone itself you know so that sort of helped maybe we don't know we are not sure so there is not much evidences and uh, it can sometimes backburn especially if there's a raised ict then if you do a cerebral hypothermia it can sometimes burn because your cerebral perfusion can come down so this is what i understand yeah okay, so thank you. and uh, there is one more question uh, regarding the use of biologicals suppose we have a sepsis condition so how will you uh, move regarding use of biological like rituximab or other immunosuppressants no uh, it is not advisable when you have an active like culture positive sepsis i mean you can cover with your um, anti antibiotics uh, but it is very tricky i mean you have to be very brave to go for uh, rituximab uh, or tocilizumab if you have an active sepsis going on but if you are like desperate and if you have like a proven autoimmune encephalitis uh, maybe under antibiotic cover you can go but uh, yeah it is very tricky it can worsen situations can worsen maybe i would wait till the uh, sepsis clears off and then give it i don't think so you can use a biological when there's an active sepsis yeah yeah by, by definition if you have sepsis i probably wouldn't give it exactly 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 yeah but if you are very desperate that's a different story you may still try i don't know okay so there is one more question from dr sridip like uh, regarding the loading dose of uh, levetiracetam so do we conversely go by 20 to 30 mg per kg or we give a higher dose of 60 mg per kg yeah dr darshan you want to answer that levetiracetam dose is so you know there are the recent trials yes. uh, so the high dose they, yes so when they uh, started the trials in in the uk they were going with a 20 mg per kg dose where is the initial trial when we start it was done in aldeh Uh, and then uh, we realized that the doses were not adequate so subsequent uh, second run we were uh, trial so there is a one trial in the US, uh, in, in the uk and there is another one in australia and new zealand uh, uh, there are two trials that have recently been published um, and in both of them they were do doing doses of at least 40 mg per kg and, and there are trials where they have used very effectively 60 mg per kg Uh, we inadvertently gave 100 mg per kg at kings for a child and nothing happened so uh, and there were no side effects so i think it's a pretty safe drug and what we know is uh, we need at least uh, 40 mg per kg but it's very safe to give 40 mg per kg so in our hospital our guidelines we have changed to 40 mg per kg okay. as the loading okay, okay sir thanks this one more question yes, sir, just to, the, just to add one comment sir uh, uh, yes, can you yes, sir of yeah. Uh, is, yes. uh, yeah, yes. in, in the equip trend uh, trial and all it's not about the just about the high dose it's about how uh, fast you give all time. five minutes five in, minutes we can give oh uh, yeah is it's not uh, like 20 to 30 minutes uh, over minutes it was the previous practice just 5 to 10 minutes yes uh then next question is uh, do we need to we are on super refractory seizure do we need to treat all the eeg seizures or which all specifically we need to treat Dr. Darshan, you want to take? Um, so yeah. uh, that is a very good question. It is yeah. um, that is not an easy answer for that. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think you need to get a feel of uh, how things are evolving uh, with time. So if you are getting a picture where uh, your EEG seizures often will be that uh, you you are dealing with just EEG seizures because you paralyzed the kid uh, with your anesthetic agents. so you often you're not relying on motor phenomena any more and you're relying just on the eeg so what we rely on that is the pattern that is evolving and if you're getting better periods of a background coming up and you're just occasionally getting an eeg seizure uh, that i wouldn't uh, uh, escalate uh, medications at that point of view and it's always a balance between uh, side effects uh, versus uh, the drugs that you use for trying to terminate all the seizures and that is one big message uh that has to be taken is the overall outcome of the child doesn't depend on eeg seizures it depends on everything put together probably more important is the abc even down the line so uh i would i would uh, be more worried about uh the side effects that we are causing with anesthetic agents rather than trying to terminate all the eeg seizures uh, so one question i just need to I, i would like to add to it Like, uh, what is the cutoff for birth suppression you would be targeting? Uh, so, I, in my practice, I try and keep it less than a minute. 
So uh, often it is best if you can keep it less than 30 seconds. Ideal would be, you know, if you can get the burst suppression between uh, around 10 uh, seconds is great. But practically, when we are titrating these medications, at one point it may be, it may look around 10 seconds, but then you just do it later on, uh, the drug is coming out of the, uh, you, know, you know, what's accumulated in the fat, etc. It's very hard to maintain that suppression. But one thing is important is it should not overshoot. It should not go for, um, you know, minutes together. Uh, try and keep it within 30 seconds would be ideal. But that is, uh, that is what I've learned from my teachers. So. Yes, sir. There's uh, one more question. How common is uh, seronegative autoimmune encephalitis? And uh, do we need to give immunotherapy for all children? Like, suppose we are done with the workup and we have got everything as negative. Still, the uh, child is ceasing. Do we go ahead with the immunotherapy? I think. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, yeah I'll take up this question. So, uh, I reviewed recently about uh, the seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. It said it could be as common as 40 to 50 percentage, actually. Because uh, you know that uh, every six months it is said that one novel, you know, surface antibody has been identified every six months. So right now we have around 22 surface auto, uh, autoimmune antibody encephalitis syndromes. And it is expected it will only increase in the future. So zero negative does not mean that there is no antibody. Uh, if you have an indirect evidence, for example, if your oligoconal bands is increased or if you have like indirect immunomarkers like a GAD or TPO being positive, or your CSR protein is on the higher side, it always means that there is some unidentified antibody which is still there. And uh, uh, yeah, you have to be as aggressive for a seronegative autoimmune encephalitis as you are for a, a seropositive autoimmune encephalitis, okay? So it is basically, is that, that you have reasonably excluded all form of infectious encephalitis. And if you have like a progressive course over weeks, you always think it's uh, autoimmune encephalitis clinically. Of course, there can be rare metabolic or rare genetic causes you still need to work upon. And uh, it is common. Zero negative is common is my final message. And you need to be as aggressive as, uh, as your zero positive. You can actually ask your lab, autoimmune lab. Like uh, when I was in Kerala, we used to discuss with Dr. Sudhiran and Amrita lab. So you can ask them to you know, process your sample on uh, rat, mouse, brain, uh, tissue staining, immunohistochemistry. So that will actually say whether there is some you know, novel antibody, which is binding on to some, uh, some portions of your rat brain. So once I had a child with an progressive, you know, subacute sort, sort of an ataxia, and there was a novel antibody, which was binding to the neurons. And later on, it was identified as an M glutamate receptor antibody. So you can talk to your lab. Okay. It is that your commercial panel is negative. It does not mean that the child does not have autoimmune encephalitis. It could be still a novel antibody. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. So, uh, next question is for the uh, neurologist specifically. So, uh, in your experience of this autoimmune encephalitis, uh, how do you follow up? Like, uh, do you do you end up with usually neuropsychiatric disabilities and learning disorders? And uh, what is your experience in the autoimmune encephalitis? So, yeah. this is uh, yeah, the question is away from not just refractory. You're just talking about every immune or just or autoimmune refractory status epilepticus. I think autoimmune refractory seizures. The factory. Yeah, uh, because you know, uh, the other group where uh, you present with behavioral changes, catatonia, uh, mild seizures, they do extremely well. Uh, but uh, the refractory uh, autoimmune encephalitis, uh, uh, they are uh, not, the outcomes are not so great. Uh, often they have, um, we don't know exactly what cause is causing the damage. I think it will be multifactorial. Uh, but uh, often they have uh, significant uh, neurological comorbidity. So even in this case, even though he looks uh, pretty good uh, on the videos, he's gained weight and his motor function has improved, uh, his uh, peripheral neuropathy has improved, uh, there is still significant cognitive difficulty for this boy, uh, you know, nine months down the line. Um, but um, yeah, that is, I think, the reality, even though um, uh, this, the, the morbidity is pretty high. I think uh, we have crossed quite a lot of time, but then it is a very exciting, exciting discussion. So and uh, everybody are in here discussing. I think we will have to wind up. Uh, any personal questions? You can directly contact Darshan or uh, Akbar uh, or Bipin. Uh, if anyone of you don't have his contact, please feel free to contact me. I will either connect you with you for personal discussions. Now I think it's time for us to wind up.
thank you everybody for coming on board this is our second time we are doing this discussion uh, we can try to improvise each and every time uh, again we are trying to focus try and pick up important intrinsic issues discuss practical aspects and make it more lively and this uh, more into discussions i hope uh, we have done justice the faculties were brimming with knowledge and experience uh, we got a lot of information thank you for coming on board uh, bipin akbar and darshan and parag had to leave because he had some covid related uh, emergency in his hospital so he thanks on his behalf uh, thank you